Grace, mercy, and peace be yours through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. God's word for our consideration this evening is our gospel reading. That was from John chapter 12. I'd like to reread at this time the first couple of verses. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. So far, God's word. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there was a dynamic young pastor who had been called to a rural congregation. And the hope was, is that he would help bring in people from the urban community that was moving out into the country. You see, this young pastor was well known for his preaching skills. And week after week, as he would ascend the pulpit, he would give these fine sermons, leading people to a higher level of Christian living. His sermons were very practical. They would give lots of advice on how to live the Christian life. And of course, he would also encourage them to, to read their Bibles and, and to pray. One day, there was a little slip of paper in the pulpit. And written neatly on that little slip of paper were the words, Sir, we want to see Jesus. And he read that slip of paper and read it again and read it again. Sir, we want to see Jesus. And he began to think, why were people asking him, Sir, we want to see Jesus? So he reread some of his sermons. And as he reread them, he noticed that he emphasized over and over and over what people were to do rather than what Jesus had done. And so he took those words to heart. And thereafter, every sermon that he wrote, he asked himself, is this message helping my people see Jesus? We ask ourselves, why do we gather here week after week, month after month? Do we not gather here because we want to see Jesus? Isn't that why you have come tonight? To see Jesus. Yes, we want to learn how to live Christian lives. We want to learn how to love one another more and more, how to have better families, how to love our God with all of our heart and strength and mind. That is part of it. But the main reason that we gather is simply because we want to see Jesus. We want to see his love for us. We want to see what he's done for us to make us his own. We want to see his glory as our Lord and our God. We want to see Jesus in the sermons that are preached. We want to see Jesus in the hymns that we sing. We want to see Jesus in the readings that we read. We want to see Jesus in the prayers we pray. pray. We want to see Jesus in the sacraments we receive. That's why we come. We come because we want to see Jesus. And when we focus on Jesus, when we focus on our Lord instead of on ourselves, what often happens is our problems, our struggles get smaller and smaller. They diminish because we're not so consumed with self because we focused on Jesus. Sir, we want to see Jesus. In our lesson, we read how some Greeks come to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of Pentecost. And while they're there, they come to Philip and they ask these very words, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Now we want to understand, it's important to understand, that these words of our lesson today happened on Tuesday of Holy Week. So Jesus and the plan of salvation is quickly coming to his conclusion 
In three days, Jesus would be led to the cross. Just a little aside, it's interesting to note, when Jesus was born, Gentile Christians from the East came because they wanted to come and worship Jesus, the Magi. Now here Jesus is nearing death. We again see Gentile Christians coming to see Jesus. Sort of the bookends of Christ's life. So when we understand that this is Tuesday of Holy Week, and that soon Jesus is going to die, these words of our Lord make a little more sense. He says to these men, The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I tell you. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it continues to be one kernel. But if it dies, it produces much grain. These words of our Lord are amazing. They're wonderful, and they're a little perplexing maybe to us if we don't dig a little deeper. Because the Lord is reminding us that he is about to be glorified. Glory is going to be brought to him. How? Through the cross. Through his suffering, through his pain, through his death. And we think to ourselves, how in the world is that glory? That's not glory. That's shame. That's weakness. But you and me as believers, we understand that this is the love of God being shown in all of its fullness. God gives his only begotten son in love to die for us. That's the ultimate glory of our Lord. That his love is so great that he's willing to give his only begotten son that we might live forever. Jesus says, reminds us that the seed has to die. And he's that seed, the Son of God, the Son of Man, our Savior. He must die in order to produce a harvest of grain. As these final days of Jesus on earth come to an end, the world sees nothing but shame and weakness. The human, the worldly wisdom, doesn't see the glory. Doesn't see the glory of the cross where we see sin, where we see life. They see the cross and they see shame. They see death. We believers see the cross, we see God's love. Hidden in the cross, is the love of God. The Lord reaches down and snatches us sinners out of the depths. He rescues us and freely gives to us eternal life. This is the glory that is hidden in the cross. Jesus is coming now to defeat our enemy, Satan. He reminds us, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world, Satan, will be, over, will be thrown out. This is God's glory in its fullest. This is why Jesus is able to say, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, to go to the cross. In that seed, Jesus who must die, is the one who through his death sprouts life. That's the picture here. Jesus is put to death, put in the ground, but through it, that one kernel brings forth the fruit of the grain of the harvest, and that's you and me. We are the harvest. From that one seed that died on the cross comes you and me who are given life. Now that we are part of that, now that we have been attached to Jesus through our baptism, attached to his death, 
attached to his resurrection, now we have life. Now we're part of that harvest. And as followers of Christ, we want to serve. Jesus says, anyone who loves his life destroys it. And the one who hates his life in this world will hold on to it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Anyone who loves his life destroys it. What a very strange thing to say. Anyone who loves his life destroys it. What Jesus is reminding us in those verses is that if our whole focus is to find glory in this life, to love this life on earth, to get all the acclaim, to get all the rewards, to get all the success, to have all the glory that the world holds in esteem, if that becomes our love, in the end, we will destroy ourselves for eternity. He who loves his life destroys it. That's the warning Jesus is giving to us. If our whole existence is about our earthly life and about earthly successes and earthly glory, we will be lost eternally. So he goes on, and the one who hates his life in this world will hold on to it for eternal life. In other words, if we understand that the life on this earth is temporary, that this earthly life is something that will pass away, so why invest everything in this life? Why love this life, hate this life, in the sense we recognize it will pass away? That heaven is our home. We're just pilgrims here on our way to eternal life. So don't invest everything in this life. Jesus says, hate it, and then eternal life will be ours. Love the world that Jesus comes from. Love the eternal world. Our lives are more than just life on this earth. And so that changes our whole way of thinking, does it not? What the world seems as most important, the believer says, no, nah, that's not so important. And what the world says, that's not very important, the believer says, yes, it is. I need to get ready for eternity. I need to, to come to worship, to hear God's word, to receive his sacraments, because that's about my eternal life. Jesus goes on and says a little more about that hating one's life. And please, Jesus is not saying that we're to harm ourselves or to any way bring injury to ourselves. But that we keep that proper perspective of earthly versus eternal life. And that those who want to follow Jesus, they will serve him. And how does, how are we to follow Think of how does a sheep follow their shepherd? They listen to his voice. How do we, the sheep of Jesus, follow him? We listen to his voice. We gladly hear and learn what our God has to say to us. And not only do we gladly hear and learn it, we believe it. We believe the promises of God. We hold on to them. We make them part of our lives. And not only do we hear those words and we hold on to those promises, but then we do them. We obey the commands of our God. That's also part of following our Lord. We listen to his word, we believe it, and we do it. This is how we follow our Lord. 
our Savior. The life of a Christian is a glorious life. It truly is, even though outwardly it may not seem like it. Think of our Lord. He lived a glorious life. He died a glorious death because it was for us. But it was hidden. It was hidden from the world. We live our Christian lives in many ways it also is hidden in glory. It is glorious, but we don't always see that glory, and we won't see it in fullness until heaven. Now, we have to face struggles, setbacks, hardships, and tragedies. That's part of life in a broken world. And even as Christians, we may have to face things because of our faith, hatred, ridicule, persecution. That doesn't mean, though, that there is not glory in living the godly life. It's hidden. It won't be fully revealed until eternity. And Jesus reminds us that just like the world hated him, it's going to also hate his followers. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. So you see how those who love life oftentimes leave Jesus behind. They don't want to have to contend with some of the struggles of being a follower of Christ. And so they give up and they turn away. But Jesus reminds us there will be glory. He says, and where I am, there my servant will be also. We will be with our Lord in heaven. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor, will honor him. So as we live our Christian lives, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged when you don't get the pat on the back or all the acclaim. Don't be discouraged when maybe others try to, to make you feel bad for doing God's will. Don't be discouraged when causing or following Jesus seems to cause more troubles and, and more hardships. Remember that promise, the promise of honor, the promise of glory that will be revealed to all of us and all people on the resurrection. God is not fair, and thank God he isn't. God is not fair. God is not fair because he chose to punish his only begotten son for our sins. God is not fair because now he judges us in mercy and in grace. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. At our baptism, it became ours. Christ's perfection became ours, and he took our sins. We now want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus every day. We want to see Jesus for all eternity, because it's through Jesus that we have life and peace and never-ending joy. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.